Attention! By decree of the Lord of Holy Terror and by extension the God Emperor of Mankind, queries into the recorded archives who are requested are strictly prohibited. By requiring such information of a prohibited nature is tantamount to heresy. As an act of to such, it is an account and uh, the God Emperor is a free and edict. You are thusly a heretic. As a convicted heretic, you are in violation of the following. Article 1073P-977864-211-2. So, no shit, there we were, in the middle of the warp, too low on fuel to even consider stopping, when we realized that our captive ghost-summoning insectoid Xenocyker was actually a ghost-summoning insectoid Xenos demon host. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what the hell? Seriously, what in the name of the Emperor are you supposed to respond to something like that? Uh, there's bad situations, and then there's comically bad situations. Anyways, it actually took us a little while to figure out that the Xanthrope was... Eh, possessed. And none of the techies knew much about demons. And of the three of them, only Jim had been on the occurrence border during its maiden voyage as an inquisitional vessel, and he hadn't actually encountered the demon that had eventually possessed the Cogitin. So the three of them gawked at the Xanthrope's miniature smoky wings for a while, debated whether it was something that could be ignored, and eventually calmed the rest of us uh, and asked if we had any ideas what was going on. According to the armsmen fighting alongside Sarge, his swears were so vitriolic that they actually turned into little insectoid creatures as they left his mouth and had to be swatted out of the air as they tried to bite people. Given how warpy his section of the line had gotten by that point, none of us was questioning this. Doc burst into hysterical laughter when he heard. This caused a little bit of concern among the medical staff, especially the two nurses who'd seen him melting people with pteranoid biotoxin. Sister Valeri carefully relieved him of his scalpel, dosed him with something relaxing but not incapacitating, and took over Gravis Watch while he giggled his way down to the cells to see the wings for himself. After a brief period of mindless panic, Nubby denied all responsibility of what had happened, and then had to explain to those of us who hadn't been there what exactly wasn't his fault. And Twitch just screamed, I told you it was demons, into his calm beat until Tink muted him. Over the course of the next few hours, everything that had been happening started making sense. There were some initial confusion about how it was all possible, since the xenologist adept kept telling us absolutely could not possess Tyranids. He gave us a big lecture on how the hive mind worked and trotted out the old line that Nids not having minds or souls, though anyone who's seen a demon engine stomping around the battlefield could tell you neither of those things are strictly required. Anyways, the man was obviously full of shit. I mean, <laughs> we could all see the wings, just sitting there being all smoky and sinister, if a bit on the tiny side. I can't really argue with that. So whether it was a matter of a dozen unimaginable coincidences coming together to make the impossible possible, or if it was the Emperor just deciding to screw with us, we had the first known case of possessed Terranids sitting in the cells. Oh, we hoped that Oak's research buddy would be happy with it because we weren't going to go back to get another one. Where the demon had come from was a little bit more clear. See, back during the first trip on the occurrence board, we'd come down to the Psyker containment cells and found them occupied by five child psychers in stasis and a half-pint demon host who wasn't. 
after we looted the crucial parts of the machinery restraining the demon host as well as the five non-possessed children, the thing had chased us across the ship. It had looked like the kid with massive wings made of smoke, curly horns, glowing eyes. Well, at least until we shot his host's body to pieces, then it ran off to get a new one. The demon came back a little later as a narlock with the same wings and such, and had then gotten tangled up in a fight with a gigantic demonic servitor titan thing that the tech priest acting as the ship's captain had been constructing for whatever insane reason. That had ended with the narlock being incorporated into the survey titan and demon taking over the cogitin. It took some doing, but we eventually destroyed the Servi Narlo Titan, pitched the Cogitan into the bridge lift shaft, and cranked the gravity up as high as it would go. That done for the Cogitan, and between reducing its host to a greasy crater and our subsequent exit from the warp, we'd assumed that we'd seen the last of the smoke winged demon as well. The fact that the Cogitan's crater could never be repaired, even by replacing entire sections of the floor and wall, and the way it screamed at people in binary, probably should have tipped us off. So we dismissed the glowing, screaming crater as just another recordance border thing. Trust me, it doesn't sound stupid after you've been on the ship for a while, and got on with our lives. It didn't come to our attention again until after we began refurbishing the cells in preparation for the Xanthrope and had discovered that there was some sort of demonic portal linking the cell that held the demon host first to the crater. Once again, we dismissed it as just another phenomenon and pretty much forgot about it. <laughs> in retrospect... Even without the demonic involvement, it should have occurred to us that having some sort of warp portal inside of all the psi shielding and warp presence shrouding was a very bad thing. Not being demonologists, we had no idea whether the demon had been lurking in the cell or the crater all this time, or if it actually had returned to the warp via the places that it had tainted. Either way. The presence of a restrained and frequently unconscious psychic being with no emperor or hive mind to protect it must have looked incredibly tasty to it. The demon had probably been slowly corrupting the Xanthrope ever since we caught it. How that works with a giant bug anyways. I mean, does the demon tempt it with promises of sugar or something? <laughs> But anyways, we felt fairly certain that Sarge knocking the Xanthrope out unconscious and into the tainted cell had been the final straw. After we'd figured out that what we were dealing with, as Twitch put it, a demon throat, and one that was sort of connected to this warp portal which bypassed all the side shielding around the cells to boot, all the stuff that the ghost nids made sense. Well, sort of. We didn't know what exactly they were, but at least it was clear how they were being called into existence despite this anthrope being contained in the cell. None of us were experts on imprisoning demon hosts, but we were pretty sure it took a bit more than a few psi suppressors and a stasis field to do the job properly. Of course, knowing that you're doing something wrong isn't the same as knowing how to do it right. The Inquisition had always operated under the assumption that demon lore was a very need-to-know subject, and in the Inquisition's opinion, a bunch of dumb grunts most certainly did not need to know. And mind you, until this shit show, we'd agreed with that assessment. But none of us had ever imagined that we'd wind up trying to prevent a demonically possessed psychic bug from summoning tides of ethereal tyranids, or at least not without just killing the damn thing and calling it a day. Many ways, the point is that our team's combined knowledge of demon binding, or whatever you call it, consisted of a suspicion that it probably involved a bunch of runic circles, holy icons, and sinister-looking chains that weren't actually connected to anything load-bearing. 
the key words there were suspicion and probably, by the way. So lacking even the slightest idea of how to handle the demon directly, we decided to hope like hell that dealing with the source of the problem would somehow fix everything. All of our highly developed problem-solving skills were focused on the demonically tainted cell, and a complex plan of action was formed. Which is to say that we set up a blast shield and tossed a half dozen debt backs into it. Of course, the just blow at the demonic portal plan didn't work. But you know, it might have, and it would have been really silly not to check. So after establishing that all we'd managed to do was severely damage the shrine surrounding the Conjutin's crater and scare the shit out of a bunch of tech acolytes working on the bridge lift, we moved to our next low-effort solution. We took one of the three spare pieces of size shielding, crammed it into the doorway of the tainted cell, and slapped a few dozen prayer seals on it. When that didn't work, we added the two other pieces of shielding, and then when that didn't work, we finally allowed Fumbles to take a look. That was a nervous ten minutes, let me tell you. Despite our very well-founded concerns, letting the accident-prone Psyker poke at the demonic warp portal worked out fine. Mostly because the size suppressors kept him from doing anything when he eventually spazzed out. Afterwards, after Fumble had woken him up and Twitch had stopped adjuring him and throwing holy water around, the Psyker blarely reported that nothing we were doing was actually having any effect on the flow of demonic energy between the tainted cells and the demonthrope. However, he was reasonably sure that increasing the distance between the two would at least reduce the flow a bit. Since moving the warp portal wasn't an option, the only way to accomplish this was by moving the demonthrope, plus the various pieces of the technology which kept it from killing us all. The task of figuring out how to more or less relocate in the entirety of the cells fell to Tink, who immediately declared it to be impossible. This, however, did not stop him from calling the Council of Nerds, including old Bill and Hannah, uh, to figure out exactly how impossible it was, though. Tink and his little think tank quickly established that the only system in the cell that could be easily moved was the Psi Suppressors. This was primarily because they'd stopped bothering to bolt the suppressors back down between maintenance cycles, so they were just all taped on the floors and walls. On the other hand, the size shielding and warp presence shroud, which Fumble said were hiding in the Demon Thropes location from the Ghost Nids, were pretty much built into the structure of the cells. Just removing them would require days of cutting, during which the ghost nid would probably swarm the cells. Finally, the stasis unit restraining the demonthrope was not designed to be moved. Jostling the focusing array could cause problems ranging from flickers to spontaneous bisection of anything inside the stasis field, and the power efficiency hadn't even been considered in its design, so running it off a battery was gonna be tricky. The first problem to be solved was the stasis field. Tink and Fio realized they didn't have to fix everything wrong with the Demon Throat stasis unit, since they had a much better one sitting nearly finished just a few rooms away. Their decision to repurpose Gravis' stasis unit almost got the two of them stabbed by an enraged medic. But, luckily, they were able to propose a solution for keeping Gravis alive as well. Tink explained, from behind an overturned table, that there was no reason that the nearly dead Space Marine couldn't just be thrown into the Demon Thropes stasis unit after the bug had been relocated. Doc had not been too happy leaving his patient, even in stasis, next to a demonically tainted hole in reality. But eventually agreed to allow Tink to flee the medbay. The side shielding and the shroud were much trickier problems, and a fair bit of time was spent lamenting that the whole mess at the station had ruined our original plans to requisition enough material to completely rebuild the cells. 
after a few hours of trying to figure out how to pull everything out and set it back up before the tide of ghost nits killed everyone, the ludicrous proposal of cutting a massive hole through the ship and moving the cells, minus the warpy bit, as one big old thingy was put forward. Luckily, old Bill saved us all from that retarded plan when he decided to take a second look at the list of parts that needed to move. Consummate scrounger that he was, old Bill could typically suggest five different alternatives to any missing critical part, and he was better than a savant when it came to keeping track of what had been used where and whether it would be missed. His abilities had let him down a little bit when it came to highly specialized systems in the cells, but they came to our rescue in a big way when he asked whether a psi shield panel was anything like a psi focusing panel. After some debate, Tink pointed out that it was all moot since there weren't any psi focusing panels in our inventory. Mole Bill asked whether anyone thought our headless astropath still needed the ones lining his sanctum. One quick check of the dried brain splattered sanctum later, it was established that the panels which focused incoming astropathic message on the chair in the middle of the sanctum could indeed be repurposed as shields. Theo, who would become the resident expert on anything underlying theory of most of the systems in the cells, claimed that it was just a matter of tweaking the machinery that aligned the crystal matrix in each panel, and began estimating how long it would take to move them all to the bay that had been picked as being the new cells. Tink then asked why the hell we should bother moving them. The decision to just repurpose the occurrence borders bridge adjacent astropathic sanctum as a demon throat holding area was reached quickly by Tink and his fellow nerds. It took a little bit more time and a lot more shouting for Sarge, the captain, and the navigator whose sanctum was right next door to come around, and at that time was used to tackle the final problem, the warp presence shroud. The shroud was the device in which hid the warp presence of anyone inside from those outside. Such devices were typically used to hide vulnerable psychers from hungry demons during warp travels, but they were also great for hiding from other psychers. Since the occurrence border had been smuggling child psychers, a practice which the Inquisition sort of frowns upon, the cells had a very good shroud. Though it hadn't done jack to hide the xanthrope from the demon that had been lurking inside its radius. Anyways, this well-made shroud consisted of a fair-sized pile of arcane machinery which was unfortunately hooked up to some projector matrix embedded in the psi shielding. Once again, it seemed like days of disassembling while fighting off ghost nids onslaughts would be needed, but Fio had a better idea. The little cow scientist claimed that the block of wraith bone he'd been playing with for the last few weeks had some interesting anti-war properties, and he was 72.361% sure that it could be used to build something that would work like a shroud. It was a mark of everyone's exhaustion that the annoying little Xenos idea was accepted without argument. So, roughly 26 sleepless hours after our discovery of the Xanthrop's wings, we designed a new cell to contain it. 30 hours of hard work and heroic ghost nid killings after that, the new cell was complete, and... All that was left to do was transport the barely restrained Xenos demon host through a ship filled with the ravenous insectoid warp ghost it called into existence. When Tink said everything was ready, all of us plus Fio and Gravis' mobile medical monstrosity gathered in the cells. During the prior few days, We'd managed to hold off ghost snits and keep the Space Marine alive despite the steady increase in the Demon Throat's power over the ship and the irreparable failure of one of the size suppressors. 
During the little free time we'd had, a route had been plotted from the cells up through the lower decks of the bridge lift and finally to the sanctum. The corridors were cleared of impediments. All the armsmen that could be spared from the main lines were stationed at checkpoints along the route, and the new stasis unit had been mounted on a motorized cargo pallet. When the last of the preparations were finished, Sarge alerted the captain, who sent out a shipwide warning that we got ready for the most heroic prisoner transfer of our lives. The first step to transfer was moving the demon rope from its old stasis unit to the new mobile one. There's probably a whole chapter on this sort of thing in whatever the Inquisitional equivalent to uplifting primer is. You're probably supposed to use all sorts of seals, powerful psychers, and some of that special tyranny tranquilizer the scythe had. We made do with a few ropes, a ramp made out of a wall panel that no one would miss, and a cargo net. Tink lined up his long-distance manipulation tool, see poking stick, on the stasis unit's off button, then jabbed it and dove for cover. As the stasis field vanished, a pair of deep red spots appeared on the demon throat's metal-covered face, and its stubby little smoky wings suddenly expanded to their full meter in length. A horrible soundless screech echoed through the cells, thousands of insects began pouring out of every crack and crevice, and a corona of black-edged green lightning formed around the demon throat. Then the gargonet yanked it off its grab plates and dragged it face down onto the corrugated metal ramp. The demon throat flailed around for a little, but didn't have enough strength to offset the manly and womanly muscles of four guardsmen. We dragged it screeching and kicking up sparks into the waiting stasis unit and field turned on the field. The insects around the room vanished and little puffs of black and green smoke but a faint echo of the psychic screeching lingered. Man, the spots where the demon throat's expanded wings met the edge of the stasis field smoked in an ominous way. Sarge decided that this shit was too eldritch for his liking and yelled at Tink, Feel, and Doc to move their asses. Doc was in a bit of a panic on the account of how insects had been crawling out of Gramps' torso wound during the demon throat's transfer, and the fact that every life support system hooked up to the Marine was screaming for attention. He dithered around, trying to figure out what to treat first, until Sarge resolved the thing by hefting graphs off his life support bed. Doc tried and failed to keep everything connected as the torso fied Space Marine was hauled across the room, then just gave up and helped Sarge. Gravis started to spasm and spur all sorts of disgusting fluids as he was pushed into the bubble of Null G in the middle of the stasis unit, prompting Doc to, in a panic, hit the on button a little too early. He apologized profusely as he bandaged Sarge's slightly shorter finger and sprayed disinfectant on everything Gravis had dribbled on. While Gravis was moved, Tink and Theo ran around directing us and their drones in the process of moving the size suppressors. Extensions were spliced into the power cords of each of the hacked together Tau Imperial hybrid devices, and a jumbled circle of arcane machinery was formed around the demon throat stasis panel. Then, piece by piece, each of the size suppressors was fastened to the pallet until it bristled with various engines, antennas, crystals, and less identifiable pieces of tech. When the suppressors were fastened down and connected to the large battery array mounted on the front of the pallet, and Gramus was eh, safe-ish in the demon throat's old stasis unit, we were pretty sure that his expression of pain and horror wasn't anything to worry about, we readied our weapons and got ready for the hard part. Sarge sent the final warning to the captain and counted down. As Sarge reached zero, Spot 2.0 opened the outer door to the cells, and all across the ship, the Terranid warp ghosts paused in their pursuit of repositioning armsmen, turned to focus on us, and solidified. We came out of the cells at a dead sprint.
or at least those of us that were on foot did. Feel was perched on a semi-clear spot on the pallet behind the demon throat, gibbering in his drones and tow speak, and doing his best to keep everything from spontaneously exploding. Tink had a similar spot on the battery pack and was splitting his attention between steering the pallet and scouting ahead with Spot. Twitch and Sarge were on point, pulling ahead and covering each corner of the doorway. Amy and Doc were keeping an eye on our flanks from the middle of the group. Finally, Nubby was squeezed into a crevasse at the back of the pallet, where he was simultaneously able to cover our rear and avoid doing any running. To our immense relief, we had made it to the end of the corridor without the demon throat doing anything warpy or a swarm of ghostness just appearing around us. Tink and Fio had said that leaving the cells wouldn't suddenly grant the demon throat more power, but the rest of us hadn't been so sure. Anyways, after the first straightaway, we began winding through the area around the cells in a manner that could be best described as, uh, <laughs> drunken. Despite all appearances, though, it really was the fastest route available. Due to the chaotic nature of the occurrence border, the size of the pallet, and the amount of the ship occupied by the ghostnids, the path we'd mapped to the sanctum was anything but direct. The first leg involved the winding path around the cells area, which took us dangerously close to the ghost in its territory before depositing us at one of the few major tilt corridors still under our control. We ran as fast as we could through the connecting corridors across recently cleared storage bays and up to the occasional micro lift, ignoring the various minor phenomena, maddening whispers, and occasional unclear technical hazards. Our progress was surprisingly good, possibly because we were lent extra motivation with what sounded like every ghost net on the ship baying for our blood, but <laughs> it wasn't enough to keep us entirely out of the swarm. The first pack of ghost nids crawled its way out of an oversized air vent as we exited a short in bay lift. Luckily, that first part hadn't included any ghost homogons or higher forms. It was just a bunch of homogons and rippers, though they were significantly more solid than we encountered during the previous weeks. Solidity aside, we knew how to deal with a bunch of melee hostiles coming up a coverless corridor. Nubby began picking off the lead bugs with his pulse rifle while Twitch dug through his detonators, and the rest of us kept moving. As the bulk of the pack passed a pair of yellow X marks on the corridor walls behind us, Twitch found the right detonator and set off two of the frag mines he lined in the corridor with. Doc and Amy paused for a second to help Nubby mop up the stragglers. And then everyone returned to their positions, and our flight continued without the pallet ever losing any speed. As the last of us left the corridor, Twitch armed the rest of the mines, and a minute later we heard them start going off. Variations of that little scuffle were repeated a dozen times as we escorted the demon throat towards the checkpoint at the start of the tilt corridor. The ghost nids were harder to kill than they were encountered in previous weeks, and took just as much to kill them as a real Tyranid, despite the way they poofed into smoke when they finally died. However, on the bright side, the bug's new solidity seemed to have robbed them of their ability to just move through walls, though they did make up for their freakish ability to home in on us. Wave after wave of bugs came up behind our little convoy, as well as through the vents of the walls and ceilings and eventually ahead of us as our course turned back towards the ghost mid territory. The continuous attacks slowed us down a little, but didn't pose a serious threat. They were just gaunts and rippers, after all. We were bloody guardsmen. Mowing down endless wave under armed Xenos with superior firepower is what the Emperor made us for. Between Twitch's minds, the early warnings and targets marked by Spot the Wonder Drone, and a giant pile of pulse ammo we brought along, we dropped most of the nids the second we saw them. Of course, 
That's not to say that everything went our way. Either the demon throat was exhibiting some serious power despite its stasis state, or the occurrence reporter's warpy little machine spirit had a really twisted sense of humor. On four occasions during our twisty run towards the checkpoint at the bottom of the tilt corridor, we ran into phenomena that seemed specifically designed to either slow us down or assist the ghost nids in killing us. Two of the delays were frustrating, but non-lethal in and of themselves. Twice, immediately after Spot had flown through a doorway, it slammed shut, and reopened to an all-too-familiar giant room filled with fire when we reached it ourselves. The first time it happened, Twitch led us to a winding detour which had involved several ghost knit attacks in tight corners. The second time, Tink just plasmed us a new door right next to the fiery one. The demon throat, or maybe just our terrible luck, struck again at the midway point of the first leg of our journey, when all simultaneously ran out of breath and were deafened by a shrill and chittering neighing sound. It wouldn't have been that much of a problem, except for the fact that it coincided with attacks from our front and rear by waves of gods. The sudden slowdown and inability to communicate might have been lethal for our exposed point men if the rest of us hadn't been on our toes. Doc and Amy, operating completely independently, both tossed frags at the pursuing swarms and grabbed hold of the motorized demon throat pallet right as Tink floored it, and Nubby took care of the stragglers. They arrived just a little too late to prevent the frontal attack from reaching Sarge and Twitch, but Sarge was a big boy who could handle a few scrapes and scratches, and Twitch just hid behind the beefy non-com until relief arrived. The final serious phenomena occurred only two rooms from the checkpoint and very nearly got us all killed. We were crossing a storage bay that apparently held tanks of drinking water, headlight fluid, pressurized liquid, chlorine, and toothpaste. When a pack of ghost nids clawed a hole through a door on Amy's flank, as she started picking off the bugs, a sort of howling spectral gaze manifested in the corridor behind the bugs, and three of them were propelled through the hole like angry insectoid cannonballs. One gaunt was shut out of the air, the other pancaked against the toothpaste tank, and the third landed on Amy. Amy's panicked snapshot missed the gaunt passed a centimeter in front of Fio's face and exploded one of the crystal-tipped suppression pylons mounted on the demon throat's pallet. The lights abruptly went out. Frost began to form along the walls, and the bay's Vox system began screaming at us in a mix of Jantine, Battlecant, and Hrud. All of us except Amy, who was trying to keep the gun from eating her face, and Nubby, who helpfully shot it off her, activated our tech lights and scanned the room for any sort of new warpy threat, while Fio tried to repair the suppressor and Tink kept the pallet moving. Our rubbernecking was brought to an abrupt halt by three sudden realizations. <clears throat> First... The ghost knit on top of Amy was reforming instead of dissipating into smoke. Secondly, the screaming Vox was just a leakage alarm as opposed to some sort of warp phenomena. And finally, the Amy shot had terminated in the pressurized chlorine tank. Amy practically teleported out from underneath the reforming gun, which Nubby shot a few more times for good measure. And we bailed out of the base so fast that we literally stampeded the nids coming out in front of us. As we exited, Doc attempted to close the bay behind us, only to find one of those little yellow notes apologizing for scrounging the door's control panel. He settled for tossing a nade at the now reformed Gaunt and the other nids that were moving through the gaps with impunity. We hit the tilt corridor checkpoint at a dead sprint, with the ghost snids and gas hot on our heels. 
It took the armsmen defending the barricade packed four-way junction a few seconds to register our presence, which was actually understandable given the way the bugs were holding off or started to reform as we approached. When the sergeant of arms leading the group finally realized we were there, he nearly put a round in the demon throat out of sheer reflex, but Sarge caught him in time and started belting out orders. Our initial plan there would have been to take a breather, restock on ammo, and swap out the pallet batteries for the ones we stashed here. But... The reforming nids and the inexorably approaching gas cloud meant there wasn't time. Each of us grabbed what we could in the 10 seconds it took Sarge to order the armsmen to get ready to bail, preferably to somewhere airtight, and Tink coupled with the pallet in the cart thingy waiting at the edge of the tilt quarter. Fio, still busy trying to fix the side suppressor Amy had shot, screamed at the tech acolyte holding the replacement batteries to just hop on the cart and followed the terrified cogboy to board. An entire 30 seconds after our arrival, the armsmen manning the barricade beat feet. By the 40 second mark, a mix of chlorine gas and warp spawn pteranids had filled the checkpoint. Ten seconds after that, the debt packs which Twitch had left on the pile of leftover ammo turned the whole place into a gas and gore-filled crater. We would have stopped to high-five each other, but we were a little too busy holding on for dear life as we raced down, or up depending on how you looked at it, the tilt corridor. Now, for those of you who haven't been on board a ship as cuddled together as the occurrence border might be wondering what tilt corridors are. According to old Bill, they were grav lifts, or shafts with angled grab plates so you could just walk up them like a corridor instead of waiting for a lift. From back before his time when the encouraged border still had an organized ship-wide gravatic field, at some point in time during the whole transitions at the current ad hoc system, either some sort of titanic accident or the hard work of one of his predecessors had twisted all four shafts into massive ramps, which paradoxically pulled upward. The end result was that inside the tilt corridor going up ship, as we wanted to, was downhill, and pretty steep downhill at that. So picture 300 meter long slide with a six person cargo cart at the top. Now add six guardsmen, a tower scientist, and a terrified tech acolyte, and a demon throat laden pallet. Finally put a cargo bay at a 90 degree gravity shift at the bottom and give the whole thing a push. It was pretty high on the list of stupidest things we've ever traveled on, or at the top if you lump at the traversing the warp with a glorified space hulk, but at least Spot was there to record the terrifying amount of air we reached once we got to the bottom of the corridor and shot into the bay. Now, when I say terrifying amount of air, <laughs> I mean terrifying. The only reason we didn't hit the 10 meter high ceiling of the cargo bay was because of the cluster of ghostly gaunts we hit first. We exploded into the bay in a shower of chitlin and ichor, sailed over a barricade group of armsmen, passed just under a massive light fixture, and came down on another cluster of ghost nids, and skidded to a juicy halt in front of the armsmen protecting the doors of the aft cargo lift. The Hartsman just stared at us, and we stared back. <laughs> and the elderly engineer, fiddling with the doors, yelled at everyone to keep it down while he worked. Being uncomfortably aware of the way the terrible goo we landed in was reforming, we didn't waste any time sitting around oogling at the fact that we were still alive. The cargo cart was ditched, and we squeezed past the armsmen to the tilt door, where the white-haired engineer informed us that it wasn't quite ready yet. Sarge drew a breath and got ready to scream at the geezer about our impending death, the claws of the swarm of reanimating warp bugs, but then deflated when Tink, who knew the engineer, quietly explained that it would only result in a lecture about young people and their myriad feelings. 
That left with a lot of unspent rage. Sarge began pouring pulse fire into the surrounding ghost nids and yelled at us to get off our asses and do the same. We all stepped up to help Sarge and the armsmen play whack-a-bug, except for the few of us who had more useful things to do. Tink jumped off his driver's seat of the pallet, grabbed the replacement batteries from the practically catatonic tech act alike, and began replacing the nearly expended ones powering the Demon Throat Stasis Unit and the suppressors. Doc attempted to patch the defensive wounds of Amy and acquired when the Gaunt landed on her, but got told to go final someone who didn't have shooting to do, and switched his attention to the badly wounded armsmen. Fio held the small Tau-ish device he had been fiddling with up to the busted suppressor and declared his genius as the dead bugs around us stopped reforming and began to drift apart. The armsmen cheered as the ghost nids advanced slowed, and so did we when the engineer whacked the door control a few times with a spanner and it began to grind open. No one noticed when one of the tendrils of smoke rising from where the Damon Throat's wings intersected the stasis field twisted towards the Vox system set in the base ceiling. At least not until the Vox began screeching a high-pitched chittering sound. Now, an uneducated plebeian might have mistaken the sound coming from the Vox of mindless tearing and chittering, but we immediately identified it as binary and an attempt to buy the demon throat to control any nearby servitors, service schools, and convoys. A guardsman's sense is just that precise. Well, no, actually, no they aren't. But it was sort of obvious after the tech actor like smashed the side suppressors Fia had just fixed. As usual, Twitch was the first to respond, even if he wasn't actually operating under the assumption that the Mechanicus had been allied with the Demonoid and possibly the Orcs all along, and this was just the first stage of their uprising against the Divine Light of the Emperor. Luckily, we sorted that out for him before he ran into Jim or Hannah again. And even more luckily, for the tackle at, at least, Twitch couldn't get a line of sight past the panicking Tau scientist. So instead of blowing off the hapless tech acolyte's head, Twitch opened fire on the engineer's two surface skulls, taking them down before they could do any damage to the pallet. The engineer responded by throwing his spanner at Twitch, but it only bounced off his helmet, and the man apologized later, so there was no hard feelings. The rest of us took a little longer than Twitch to react, which meant the tech acolyte had time to damage another size suppressor before Tink brained him with the battery. As the second suppressor failed, a ship quick shook the bay, and the dead ghost nids stopped dissipating and began to flow together into a large pile. When the first heritage warrior emerged from the goo and began hosing the barricades with death spit arounds, we decided that it was really time that we get moving again, and sprinted for the open lift. Actually, it wasn't as unanimous a decision as most of our retreats were. Doc had become rather fixated on the armsmen he was treating, and wound up dragging the partially disemboweled man along with us into the lift. Also, as we ran by the half-conscious acolyte, Twitch raised the possibility of continued demothropic possession and lift sabotage, and suggested that blowing the cog's boy head off was, quote, the only way to be sure. Now we ended the ethical debate before it started by kicking the tech acolyte into the floor hatch the engineer had opened as an escape route for himself and the armsmen. Judging by the crashes and bangs, the maintenance shaft went down about three to four levels. But the cog boy tended to be fairly sturdy, and he looked fine when we saw him again in a few weeks. Though, possibly that could have been some other tech acolyte who was terrified of us and had an impressive collection of ladder-rung-shaped dents. Once on board the lift, we shut the door and the deteriorating situation in the cargo bay and began our slow ascent to the main cargo corridor. 
Our ride was accompanied by the sound of thousands of docenids clawing at the shaft doors, and this was made even worse by the mixture of cheery music and demonic screeches playing over the lift speakers. Those of us who weren't attempting to save arbitrarily acquired artisan, repair the damn suppressors, or calm the cogitator adept for a sit rep, scanned the shaft above us and tried to anticipate where the first breakthrough would occur. It was a very high stress situation, especially after Sarge learned that the checkpoint at the top of the lift was under heavy attack which is why several of us reflectively started shooting the walls when the lift suddenly stopped and the lights went out. There were a few seconds of wild panic, and then Tink and Feel got their wide-angle illuminators on their drones activated, and we realized a few things. Firstly, the sound of angry pteranoids clawing at the shaft had vanished, and had the reassuring background noise of our clom beads and the humming buzz of the overloaded side suppressors, but not the annoying lift music. Secondly, the shaft walls were bleeding, and it was human blood instead of tearing and anchor for a change. Also, the tormented looking faces that occasionally pressed out of the gore, then faded again, didn't look insectoid either. Finally, and most worryingly to those of us that knew the occurrence borders of foibles, the level we stalled at didn't have a big cargo bay-sized door, just an ordinary-looking hatch. Oh, and Doc's armsman was dead, but that probably had more to do with the cantaloupe-sized hole in his gut than anything eldritch. Theo, after verifying that the side suppressors were still functioning, just not being overloaded for a change, jumped at the chance to do some repairs and completely ignored the totally normal door. The rest of us gathered around it and held a completely silent debate, which ended with our fearless leader stepping forward to open it while we got ready to blow apart whatever horrors waited on the other side. As the door swung open, we all lowered our weapons, Twitch whimpered, Amy and Doc swore, Tink set spot on record, Sarge facepalmed, Nubby cheerfully waved at the smoldering bearded skeleton at the head of the poker table, who <laughs> laughed and waved back. Our arrival didn't go unnoticed by the other players at the poker table. The charred skeleton, with a chain sword at his side, turned and waved as well. And the exit wound faced man on the far side raid his beer to us before messily dumping it into the approximate area of his mouth. This caught the attention of the last man at the table, a massive angry looking fellow in scout armor, who looked surprisingly normal if you ignore the telephone pole sized tearing talon laws in his chest. He turned towards the door, knocking drinks and chips everywhere with his chest talon, then went wide-eyed as he saw us. The man immediately leapt to his feet and began striding towards the door while ranting about cowards, scavengers, and heretics. We automatically raised our weapons again, but before the ranting scout got much closer, the sword-bearing skeleton and the nearly headless guardsman shared an exasperated look got up and grabbed him by the elbows. They didn't have actually enough strength to stop the scout, but then the bearded skeleton came over and pulled down on the talon sticking out the large man's back, causing him to topple backwards. The scout marine was dragged back to the table, screaming at us the whole way, mostly about his sergeant, specifically how our incompetence had gotten him cut in half. The way we'd lost, the owner sold most of his gear and his legs, and how we'd finally left him alone and dying in a demonically tainted hole. This annoyed Doc, who thought he'd been doing a pretty good job keeping Gravis sort of alive, all things considered, and said so. On the list of sane things to do... Arguing with a dead scout marine is pretty close to the bottom, but that didn't stop Doc or Nubby and Tink, for that matter, 
All three of them started throwing excuses, explanations, and insults at the impelled scout, who expanded on his list of grievances to include being too cowardly or stupid to shoot down a flyerant, abandoning a shuttle full of his own battle brothers in a xenophilled backwater, and getting him stuck in some shitty poker room for all eternity. Nubby responded by calling his Primarch fat. The bearded skeleton who had been snickering at the exchange and Sarge's pained reaction to it fell over laughing at the remark, and the argument petered out. Once he'd regained his breath, the skeleton apologized for the new guy's complete lack of perspective, and immediately went to congratulate us for finally doing something about Frank. Since he gestured towards the pallet when he said that, we assumed that he meant the demon throat, and didn't ask why he named it. Sarge adopted his best poker face, thanked the skeleton for his praise, suggested that it's time to move again, and began to shut the door. The bearded skeleton held up a finger and suggested that we take the lift all the way up to level 39. Tink, ever the pedant, pointed out that the lift only went to level 26.5, which prompted yet another bout of knee-slapping laughter from the skeleton. Acting as if he'd said the most hilariously stupid thing ever heard, the bearded skeleton repeated Tink's statement to the three companions, two of which joined him laughing. After a few seconds, the faceless guardsman gurgled something which prompted the spoken skeleton to make a get a load of this guy gesture at him and asked us if we minded. Without even thinking, Sarge responded with shrug, then flinched backwards as the headshot corpse suddenly appeared at the doorway and began to lean out the lift. Now, talking to familiar denizens of the poker room was one thing, but one of them coming out was quite another. Most of us raised our weapons, and Sarge tried to slam the door, but Twitch grabbed his arm and gestured at the rest of us to put our guns away and back up. The nearly headless guardsman gave Twitch an appreciative sound gurgle and reached an arm out towards the lift control panel. As the corpse arms passed over the threshold, its flesh began to rot and bubble, and the lights on the drones and our armor began to flicker. With a crackling pop, the annoying lift music cut out, and was replaced by immensely creepy children's song, which the blood faces in the shaft walls began singing along to, to which began rocking back and forth and singing along as well, and for some reason Fio joined in too. Amy told them both to stop being crazy, prompted Twitch to start giggling and Fio to complain about he was just trying to fit in, and we really needed to document what was and wasn't considered crazy in our backward culture. When its rotting arm reached the control panel, the headshot guardsman began leaning his head out to get a look at what he was doing. We all reflectively looked away and didn't see exactly what happened next, but there was an insurmountably foul smell and a layer of frost formed on everything in the lift except for the demon throat stasis unit. Then the frost and smell abruptly vanished. The singing stopped, and we looked back to see the guardsmen lumbering back into the poker room, looking as normal as any massive crater in the head can. The charged spoken skeleton laughed at us, gestured towards the button label 39 that had appeared at the top of the control panel, asked if that was better, and told us to have fun. Behind him, the sword-bearing skeleton paused from restraining the scout and waved, and then told us not to fuck up because he had money on us. The last thing we saw before Sarge closed the door was the two skeletons levering up the scout, and the headshot guardsman sitting down at the bar next to a vague ghostly shape that hadn't been there earlier. We noted the absence of Doc's recently expired armsmen, and unanimously agreed to never speak of him again. When the door was firmly shut, we all stood around waiting to see if anything else was gonna happen.
After a few seconds, Nubby cheerfully announced that that went all right, clomped over to the lift control panel and pressed the new button before anyone could think to stop him. All of us swore at the little trooper as the lift launched upwards like a booster rocket had been attached to it, and a sensation disturbingly familiar to us as a bad warp transit rolled over us. It took us uh, about 8 seconds for the lift to reach level 39. This was admittedly a great improvement over its usual speed, but that didn't quite make up for the general unpleasantness of the ascent, and the way we all were launched about a meter into the air when it slammed to a stop. We staggered to our feet, attempted to look around, and realized that we were somehow unable to direct our gaze at anything but the floor and the wall in front of the lift, which held yet another door that didn't belong in a lift shaft. Nubby scampered towards the lift control panel again, only to find himself suspended in the air by his collar. Sarge handed him to Amy, walked over to the panel, and briefly perused the options before giving up and just hitting the open door button. It slid open to reveal a short, unlit hallway that was just large enough for the pallet and another door. Lacking any better ideas, we entered the hallway and were totally unsurprised when the door slammed shut behind us. What did surprise us was the words, Outer Airlock Door, for reals this time, stenciled on the inside. Tink spoke for all of us when he suggested getting through the inner door as fast as possible. On the far side of the door, we found a bunk room full of confused crewmen. When asked, they confirmed that we were indeed on level 39 and only a short distance away from the main lift. Sarge reported our position to the cogitator adept, who presumably related to everyone else while we resumed our journey to the Athropathic Sanctum. Our pace was much slower than it had been before, partially because we didn't have a pre-made route anymore, but mostly because there was no ghost nids up here to attack us, so it seemed like Theo had done a great job for repairing the size suppressors. They were nearly silent, and nothing weird was happening at all. We practically strolled through the bays and corridors, congratulating ourselves and praising the generosity of overcooked skeletons as we walked. The light mood lasted until we reached the entrance to the main lift. As the door opened to reveal the lift shaft, the tendrils of the smoke drifting from the demon throat's wings suddenly snaked around and shot downwards. Thirteen levels below us, the tendrils pulled against the roof of the shrine that had been built over the cogitator's crater, and then melted through it in a burst of black and green light. A screeching that sounded like a cross between binary tyranid and demonic echoed up the shaft and everything very abruptly went to shit. The size of pressures began making an overloaded whine, and the two that Theo had just repaired exploded. Fragments of the melted crystals bounced off our carapace armors and Spot's towel metal chassis, but Theo and the delicate machinery on the pallet weren't anywhere near as protected. The little Xenos received several nasty gashes on his face and arms. Two more suppressors began spewing clouds of smoke, and the stasis unit began emitting a steady rising whine that was horribly familiar to us. Down the shaft, several things that sounded bigger and whoopier than any ghost nid we'd ever encountered began to howl. Now, despite the occasional bouts of irrationality and insanity, we were a bunch of semi-professional badasses, so we didn't just stand around panicking over how screwed we were. Within five seconds of the suppression failure, we had four guns pouring pulse fire into the indistinct forms crawling up the lift shaft, and Doc and Tink were seen to Theo and the damaged pallet. Doc immediately diagnosed Theo's injuries as non-life-threatening, administered a few bandages and towel-safe painkillers, 
and then steered the little Xenos over to where Tink was doing his best to keep anything else from exploding. The top priority was the stasis unit, which was making the telltale sound of an imminent flicker, given that this unit didn't have any array of grab plates to keep anything inside from escaping, Tink was operating under the assumption that any flicker over a second long would result in an enraged Xenos demon host flying into the air and tearing us all to bloody pieces. He and Fio, who was badly shaken but still able to help, set to work on stabilizing, splicing, and other technical bullshit, while Doc ran over to join the rest of us in our delightful game of shoot the horrible monster before it closes into melee range and kills you. Horrible monster was really the best description we could come up with, with all that was climbing up the shaft, around, and rising in the platform. By the time Doc had arrived, we killed at least six of them between us. That's three for Amy, the show-off, and one for everybody else. But we still had no idea just what the hell these things were. We could see Tyranoid Chitlin and Claws, but they were a mix of tentacles and massive bulging eyes, and the whole mess seemed to be covered with a cloud of obscuring smoke. Twitch would jump up triumphantly, declaring them to be his long-predicted demonoids. None of us bothered to argue with him. Unlike most of our battles with the Ghost Nids, our defense of the Level 39 Lift Door, not a battle name for the history books, that wasn't a catwalk. Whatever the things were climbing up the shaft were, they could take an awful lot of fire, and they moved far faster than anything their size had any right to. We operated as efficiently as possible, calling targets, maintaining fire discipline, and making heavy use of spots marker thingy, but they steadily gained ground on us, especially where the rising lift platform, a half wall crawler, picture a metal rectangle with massive gears on three sides, blocked our line of sight. To make matters worse, the demon throat was acting all sorts of uppity. Tink and Theo managed to prevent the stasis flicker, thank the Emperor, but the damn bug was still able to inflict all sorts of inconvenient minor phenomena on us, and we could feel it trying to worm its way into our minds. Presumably, it was trying to command us to do its bidding, but <laughs> unlike the demons we heard about from the other Inquisitional agents, this thing apparently only knew how to speak binary and tyranid. So it was mostly just incoherent psychic screeching, but it was still very distracting. Man left us with massive headaches, plus a vague hunger for human flesh and motor oil. So it was pretty obvious to all of us that our situation wasn't sustainable, but luckily it didn't have to be. We really only had to hold out long enough for the lift to reach us and for us to ride up to the bridge level, where it was a short sprint to the former astropathic sanctum. Not an easy task by any means, but one that was definitely possible. Well, <sighs> at least we hoped it was possible, because the only other option was setting off the failsafe twitch had wired into the demon throat stasis unit, and it really would have sucked if we had just wound up killing the thing after hauling it halfway across the galaxy. It took an absolutely grueling three minutes for the lift to clank its way up to us, but we managed to hold off the demonids, or whatever, until it reached us. We piled on board and switched to a much lesser efficient omnidirectional defense of the edge of the platforms which we immediately realized was not going to be enough to keep them from catching us before they reached the bridge. Not liking the idea of fighting three meter tall monsters as they climbed up over the edge of the platform and directly into melee range, Sarge ordered the deployment of our remaining grenades and as many of Twitch's debt packs as he could without collapsing the walls. The wave of explosions that rolled down the shaft was like a miniature artillery barrage. It was immensely satisfying to watch bug after bug being knocked off the wall to plummet to the bottom of the shaft. The distant sound of their enraged howls ending in gooing, crackling crashes 
warmed our hearts. But it was not as much as we saw them smoke cleared, the massive concussive forces and the impacts of their fallen companions had dislodged almost every one of them climbing demonoids. We began picking off the last of the stragglers, and for a few seconds actually thought we bought enough time to reach our destination unmolested. Then the tendrils smoke of drifting down from the demon throat twisted into the giant pile of ichor and limbs at the bottom of the shaft, and something freaking massive pulled itself together. It rose out of the goo, turned a horned head towards us, and spread its wings that touched the edge of the shaft. The five of us looked over the edge and swore as what looked for all the world like winged high tyrant with extra eyes and tendrils launched itself upwards. We immediately opened on um, full auto, just indiscriminately hosing the demonic tyrant with as much pulse fire as possible, which accomplished very little from the side of making it angry. It was hard to tell whether the thing was shrugging off our fire or regenerating its injuries, but the end result was the same, and Sarge quickly ordered a change of tactics. Tink ran over and joined us, nailing the flyer with a big old ball of armor-piercing plasma, while the rest of us focused our fire on Spot's marker light. Our target was the thing's wing, specifically the joint where the left one connected to the shoulder, which we figured was a rather delicate and vulnerable spot in the flyer's armor. This proved true. Unfortunately, the result when we finally burned through was disappointing. The wing did shear off and drop down the shaft, but the flyer didn't follow it down. The demon throat smoky tendrils coalesced around the bloody joint and then sprang out to form a new wing before the beast had fallen more than a meter. With what was unquestionably a laugh, the flyer resumed its flight. We were understandably frustrated by this development, but not defeated. We shot the smoky wing a little just to see if that would work. And when it didn't, we shifted our fire to the other wing, mostly out of stubbornness. Once the wing had reformed out of smoke too, and the flyerant let out another horrible demonic laugh, we began directing our fire at the what little we could see of its head. Well, most of us did. Nubby and Twitch decided that the Emperor could worry about the structural integrity of the shaft, and began unloading the Demolition Trooper's pack. The first step pack pegged the flyerant at the tip of its pointy head and knocked a half a meter down when it detonated, but didn't do more than blacken and crack the thing's chitinous armor. Before those could heal, though, a second pack exploded in the air just behind it, damaging it further and temporarily disrupting its solidity of its wings. Now, if Twitch hadn't been running low on munitions, it sounds impossible, I know, but several weeks of constant fighting was enough to run down even his stockpiles. This renewed explosive assault might have been enough to stop the flyerant. Unfortunately, he and Nubby ran out of debt packs far before the giant demonic bug ran out of whatever kept it alive. That didn't mean Twitch was out of explosives, though. Just ones that could easily be used against the moving target. When the flyerant came through the ninth debt pack explosion, looking as pissed as ever, <laughs> uh, he instructed Nubby to grab a few parts from Tink or Fio and began messing with the mixed uh, assortment of mines he had left. Of course, the rest of us weren't just standing around while this went on. We kept putting fire into the flyerant's head and shoulders. We just had no idea if it was actually accomplishing anything. By our reckoning, we've done far more damage than it had taken to kill the non-demonic flyerant that bisected Sergeant Gravis, but even the gaping holes left by Tink's weapon seemed to be filling in almost as fast as we were inflicting on them. Nubby quickly acquired the parts Twitch wanted, and then ran around collecting everyone's leftover flash and smoke grenades. Mind you, he didn't bother asking any of us for them. The little klepto just sort of drifted by like a rancid breeze, and they were gone. Anyways, 
everything even vaguely explosive was loaded into Twitch's pack. The makeshift detonator was rigged, and the improvised bomb was placed at the edge of the lift, where Tink threw a sizable wrench into the plan by refusing to attach it to Spot. So, right there, with all of us still firing our weapons on full auto, and the flying rate closing in on us, Twitch and Tink started screaming at each other like a pair of five-year-olds. Twitch said his bomb had to be set off right up against the Flyerin's slightly less armored underside, and Tink was equally adamant that Spot 2.0 wouldn't be sent off to the same explosive death as the original Spot. It was one of those philosophical thingies. You know, an unstoppable madman and an unmovable idiot, or something like that. And there was no time for this kind of bullshit. Realizing that trying to argue with either of them was a waste of seconds we didn't have, Sarge just grabbed the bomb bag and announced his intentions to bounce it off the wall below us and told Twitch to start the countdown. This was, of course, a terrible idea. Bags of explosives with jerry-rigged detonators are as well known for their bouncing capabilities is like the same way ogrins are known for their rape your wit. <laughs> but Sarge had already hefted the bag and he was lost, so we just kind of went with it. As Twitch counted down, Doc and Amy each grabbed one of Sarge's legs so he could lean over the edge. Tink hastily recalled Spot to a safe distance, and Nubby helpfully reminded everyone how much this would suck if Sarge missed. Sarge swung the bag back and forth by its straps, gauging its weight, the speed of the incoming flyerant, and the angle he'd have to hit the wall at. And then, as the countdown reached five, decided to hell with it and just drop the damn thing. The bomb bag did not sail through the air, or tumble through space, or anything else poetic sounding. It just dropped straight down the shaft like a pack full of explosives, passing bare centimeters from the flyman's face, and jerked to a halt as if one of the straps caught the demonic horns of the bug instead of its usual head spikes. I like to imagine it stared at the bag cross-eyed for a second as it swung there, beeping. <laughs> Despite the bomb bag not being positioned in what Twitch had deemed the sweet spot, the explosion had laminated the flyer across three of the shaft walls. <laughs> it was highly satisfying results, and we would have paused a second to congratulate ourselves Except for the fact the entire shaft was making ominous creaking noises, and the thick layer of ichor and chunky bits was writhing and bubbling. Within seconds, the whole mass erupted into those hand-sized bugs that the demonthrope liked to summon from time to time. And the last portion of our trip up the lift was spent frantically shooting and stomping the onrushing swarm. It wasn't a serious a threat as anything else the Demon Throat had thrown up at us, but that final attack was enough to keep us busy until we reached the top of the shaft, and lent us some sort of motivation to keep moving after we reached the bridge. We sprinted through the Occurrence Borders Bridge with a ravenous tide of insects behind us, and hundreds more crawling out of every niche and shadow in the room. The bridge officers and their armsmen, who apparently had been too busy doing naval things to help us with the demonic flyrant, ran around screaming and shooting, while we weaved through them and towards the door of the astropathic sanctum. Perhaps sensing that it was running out of time, the demon throat began emitting a constant stream of inconveniencing phenomena. We skidded across a patch of ice. We were buffeted by a blast of wind, suffered dozens of painful electrical shocks, and endured the most god-awful psychic racket until we reached the door Jim was holding open for us. The Athropathic Sanctum was a hemispherical room with a massive chair covered with wires and gross-looking stains in the middle. 
The floor was covered with tape down wires, markings indicating where suppressors should be installed, any small pile of furniture and clothing that probably belonged to the former astropath. As we entered the room, Jim slammed the door behind us, Fumbles jumped out of the chair, and Tink brought the pallet to a skidding stop. The three techies hastily swapped out the cords powering the stasis unit, and then all of us lifted the heavy piece of machinery off the pallet. With a quick heave, the demon throat holding stasis unit was deposited on the ex-astropath's chair, where it sat at a very awkward looking but surprisingly stable angle. As we did the heavy lifting, Theo ran around the back side of the chair where a disorganized pile of Imperial and Tau Tech was sitting at the center of a network of cables which spread across the dome ceiling like ivy. The Tau scientists flipped a switch and let out a panic scream as nothing happened. Then Fumbles plugged in the cord one of us had kicked loose back in, and the horrible psychic pressure of the demon throat's mind abruptly vanished. And that was the end of it. Right there. The bugs on the bridge disappeared in a puff of smoke, the majority of phenomena manifesting throughout the ship vanished, and all across the ship, the ghost nids lost both their focus and solidity, and stopped reappearing after death. The captain, who had been pushed all the way back to the Geller Field Generator Room, launched an immediate counterattack, which we declined to participate on the account that the bridge lift was probably broken and we were too tired to handle 60 flight of stairs. We all just sat on the floor of the sanctum, utterly exhausted, watching Tink, Fio, Jim, and Fumbles argue about why the war presence shroud Fio had built across his chunk of wraith bone was acting as a massive demon-only size suppressor. They were very agitated about the whole thing, but the rest of us really just didn't care. As far as we were concerned, it just worked, which meant we won, which meant it was now time for a nap. We wound up camped at the Demonthropic Sanctum for a few days, just keeping an eye on the thing, but it stayed put and didn't do anything warpy. Even when the non techno magical size suppressors were deactivated for installation. The demon throat was still creepy looking, mind you, with the metal covering face, glowing eyes, and smoking wings, and all of that, but it wasn't creepy feeling anymore. When coupled with the fact that the cogitator's creator no longer screamed at people, though it still couldn't be repaired. We took that as a clear sign that Fio's wraith bone thingy had done the trick, and the demon was being held in check. After our paranoia had abated, we descended into the ship to see how bad the damage looked. The final tally was nearly a sixth of the crew dead, and half again as many wounded, which meant that the second Doc showed his face downstairs, he was hauled off to the med bay and lent a hand and did not reappear for several days. On the mechanical side of the damage was considerably lighter. The ghost nids hadn't bothered to vandalize anything, so it was mostly a matter of unmaintained systems having problems and battle damage, most of which had been caused by us. Old Bill has been especially cross about this being the second time we've nearly destroyed the bridge lift shaft, and the fact that the aft cargo lift platform was just gone. <laughs> just gone. Anyways, no critical systems were damaged, and our meager fuel reserves were still intact, which meant that there was no mechanical reason not to continue our trip to the Ordos Xenos research facility. It turned out there weren't any non-mechanical reasons to stop either. The demon throat was secured, and now that Fio's wraithbone thingy was doing most of the work, the suppressors were running just fine. So, the big bug wasn't a problem, and while there were still a few ghost nids wandering around the tainted areas, without increasing numbers forcing them outward, they weren't any more of an issue than anything else that haunted those decks. 
the ground the situation was looking up to. Much to Doc's relief, when Doc escaped from his girlfriend for a few minutes and ran to check on Gravis, he found that despite the dead scout's harsh predictions, the bisected space marine was doing just fine in Demonthrope's old stasis unit. In fact, he was doing so well that he wasn't under constant attack by a spiteful possessed bug that we were able to take him out of the stasis unit long enough for Tink and Fio to get the whole thing mobile and moved up to the med bay. So we continued on our way, slowly meandering along with what was probably the most ass-backwards route ever plotted by an Imperial vessel, and things slowly returned to normal. Doc doctored and tink tinkered through mostly the wounded armsmen and the stealth shuttle instead of Gravis and the Sanctum. Jim, Theo, and Hannah kept busy repairing the ship and trying to figure out why the Wraithbone device worked the way it did and spent their free time annoying the hell out of the navigator next door by watching Tau vids at high volume in the Sanctum. Amy slightly regretfully stepped down as de facto commander of half the ship's armsmen and returned to mooching around with Twitch, Nubby, and Fumbles. Though some sort of miracle all four of them kept out of trouble, at least any serious enough that it would come to Sarge's attention, for the rest of the trip. Finally, Sarge was allowed a few days to plan things with the captain then was dragged off by the relentless diplomat adept to resume his classes. Finally, two weeks later, we came out of the warp in a single planet system. The fuel situation was such that even with a minimum distance de-warp, it took us the better part of a day to coast our way into a box range of a small station orbiting the planet. It really says something about just how low you are when you wind up using your shuttles to push the ship a few million kilometers. As we got into box range, Sarge dressed up and transmitted his credentials and the contact information he'd been given as part of the mission briefing, and held his breath. But thankfully this time, the response came immediately. The current border was clear to refuel at the station, though docking was out of the question given the fact that it was smaller than our ship. Sarge was instructed not to wait for refueling and deliver the cargo to the research facility, which was the only thing on the desert planet, as soon as he entered shuttle range. The relief that went through everyone on the ship after hearing that was massive. Doc actually cried when he heard them confirm that they actually had a med bay facility capable of treating Terranid biocontamination. The rest of us were more restrained, merely cheering and holding a wild party before blurrily dressing ourselves in our best uniform and moving Gravis and the demon throat into the shuttle. The loading of the demon throat was uneventful, except for the harrowing trip down the makeshift lift, which involved a lot of swinging back and forth, then seemed reasonable. It was crammed into the shuttle along with the usual cluster of size suppressors and a mobile version of the Wraithbone device that Theo had devised. The little Tau would not be coming down to the planet with us, this being an inquisitional facility that experimented on Xenos and all, but he begged us to bring the Wraithbone back after the Demothrope was delivered which is why his device had been mounted on the Grok Scald in case spot. The shuttle we took down was not the stealth shuttle. Ting claimed that he'd gotten it to the point where it could fly and hold air, even if most of the stealth bits were completely non-functional. But none of us like the way he kept using the words should and probably. Jim flew us down in a standard shuttle with a hole on a patch of bright lance holes in it, which failed to explode or do anything else interesting on the way to the still breaking occurrence border to the research facility. As we made our final approach, we transmitted our contact code again, and were instructed to a lone landing pad which jutted out from a completely barren mountainside and bristled with anti-air turrets. 
Jim put the shuttle down precisely in the middle of all the turrets, and our entire party, adepts and fumbles included, as this was an official event, filed out of the shuttle. We were greeted by a party of five men. The man in the middle was tall, tan, and wore a long coat that looked amazingly uncomfortable in the blistering heat of the landing pad and had one order Xenos Rosette hanging from his neck, so we pegged him as Inquisitor Cecilette. The was flanked by a cogboy, a scribe who looked like he was dying of heat exhaustion, and what we've immediately recognized as a pair of Death Watch Space Marines. Sarge snapped off a parade ground salute, which earned him a kick in the shins from the diplomat adept and formally introduced himself as Interrogator Greg Sargent, delivering one lies Danthrope on behalf of Inquisitor Oak as requested. He made no mention of Xanthrope's little problem, figuring that was a discussion best had when there were no armed space marines present. The Inquisitor accepted Sarge's introduction with a nod, and took a long look at the Demonthrope's palette. The web of cables hooked up to the wraithbone devices obscured the wings from a courtesy examination, but the man's eye obviously lingered on the half-melted metal and the general tau-ish of pretty much every piece of tech on the pallet. Thankfully, he didn't start jumping up and down screaming about heretical xenotech, and we all let out a breath of relief as he turned away from the pallet to face his two non-superhuman flunkies. That relief abruptly evaporated as he ordered them to take the xanthrope and store it in the live sample holding cells with the rest of the evidence. Before any of us had managed to absorb the implications of that last word, the Inquisitor turned back to Sarge and announced that he, his men, and his ship were all under arrest by the joint orders of the Ordos Hereticus and Ordos Xenos. Fumbles and Jim let out a little whimper, and Twitch and Nubby both immediately started going for their sidearms, but were paused as the Space Marines instantly raised their bolters. The rest of us stood there, slack-jawed, until Sarge managed to ask just what in the Emperor's name they were under arrest for. The Inquisitor's face went absolutely blank, and in a voice that seemed almost mechanical, but made Fumble shake like a leaf, he replied, For what? Well, most recently disregarding an order to cease all operations and return to the headquarters. The murder of two squads of Space Marine, the attack of an Imperial space station, and the transportation of Elysiano Psychers for purposes of heretical experimentation. But the charge at the top of the list will most certainly be aiding and abetting the rogue Inquisitor colloquially known as Oak. <sighs> well, shit.